go ahead. And introduce Good. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be able to do a little fireside chat with Joe Marcus, who is the executive chairman and founder of Alexandria Real Estate Equities, Inc. And we've had a nice relationship over the last four to five years. And I have been very fortunate to have Joel as a board member for BioHealth Innovation. And I thank him very much for, uh, for being able to sit on that board uh, and also for the contribution he's making nationally to the biohealth industry. And we're going to learn a lot more about that today. So, uh, Joel, welcome to the AURP Biohealth Caucus. Thank you. The main speaker this afternoon. And since you have a national perspective and are in seven of the largest markets in the United States, I think all of the listeners here and attendees to this conference are going to be uh, listening with bated breath to what is happening nationally and also with Alexandria Real Estate. So, I think one of the best ways to start would be for you to give a little introduction on yourself uh, and a little bit of personal bio before we start diving into Alexandria Real Estate Equities and sort of the national scene, if you don't mind. Sure, be happy to. Rich, uh, it's a real pleasure and thank you for your great leadership. I've told you many times not to flatter you, but uh, you were exactly what was needed for the biohealth region uh, to take a region which had a historically um, outstanding uh, really trajectory, then really after the collapse of the internet, uh, the bubble of back in 2001 and about a decade of really tough, slow growth in that region for a variety of reasons, um, certainly uh, after 9-11 as well, your leadership came on the scene and it really catapulted the region and really coalesced things in a way that you know we couldn't have anticipated. So really great kudos to you. I mean, I say that from the bottom of my heart because it's actually factually true. Um, so well, thank you. And it, well, I'll send you the check later. Thank you. Hey, you got it. Um, <laughs> so we started Alexandria in 1994 on the premise that um, there really was no, um, I would say, category or class of real estate focused on scientific research. And when we started the company, there was a lot of misgivings and a lot of misunderstanding of what a scientific research building, what a lab building was like. In fact, when we went out after we seeded the company with $19 million Series A, just like a typical uh, startup that we deal with today, um, led by actually Jacobs Engineering here in, uh, used to be here in Pasadena, they moved to Texas for tax reasons, but uh, in any case, um, we went to our Series B and we did 30 one-on-ones, um, and in those days it was managed by Montgomery Securities, a group I had done a lot of work with. And we literally had 30 meetings, 29 of which literally people threw us out of the uh, office, some even before we got there, on the basis that uh, these buildings were odd, they were weird, uh, you know, they were dangerous. Uh, in fact, I think GE Pension Fund said, oh, we owned one of these buildings and it caused us a lot of problem. It was a place in Connecticut. It turned out to be a printer building, printing building with printing fluid that had caused contamination. Actually had nothing to do with laboratories. Uh, but anyway, we finally did secure our Series B, literally, truly on the 30th meeting and then catapulted us, bridged us to a IPO in 1997. We raised $155 million. The company was worth about $250 million, uh, maybe a little bit more today. We're very proud of the enterprise value of the company is almost $25 billion. Here about a billion dollars a year, 25 years later. Um, and I think the way we have sought to build the company was looking at uh, really a couple of backdrops, lab space and, and scientific research buildings were really the, the infrastructure platform. Um, but beyond that, we thought it was important that we look at locations that were really meaningful. You really had to have a great location, not a, a real secondary or tertiary location. We felt that you had to be anchored with great science and technology in, in close proximity. Um, you had to have a management talent resource in the area, and very importantly, and one that uh, you know you and I have been working on together with a lot of people in the biohealth region, is risk capital. 
And if you didn't have those four factors, you probably couldn't really create uh, an ecosystem in a mini cluster or a major cluster. It just really wouldn't work out. And so those, and, and that was really, part of that was um, motivated by, you know, reading and teachings of Michael Porter, who basically talked about the cluster model, I think his first work back in 1998. And so that was really the thesis we used to go about uh, building our business and really, you know, becoming an integral part of the life science ecosystem. It, uh, it, it existed, but it really was nothing like it is today. And I think beyond that, as we built the company, we felt there were really four elements to building our company. One was the infrastructure side, two was the risk capital side, three was it's important to create um, thought leadership and policy in this area. And we see that today with uh, COVID-19 in a very important fashion. And then really corporate social responsibility. We're seeing a little bit of that uh, today, not a little bit of a lot of it in a sense of what's the obligation of you know, companies, private sector, not only their mission of improving health and nutrition, which is ours, but to do something positive for society. So that was kind of the framework and the backdrop to starting the company and growing the company to what it is today. We, we are headquartered here in Pasadena where we started. I'm sitting here today on a beautiful, quiet, sunny day, about 100 degrees. Um, and we have sought to build um, the cluster in the Seattle region, in the San Francisco Bay region, in the San Diego region, um, we're starting a bit here in the Pasadena region. Uh, it's taken many years to get start to get that off the ground. Obviously, the greater Boston region, uh, New York City, the greater uh, Maryland region, and then uh, we've uh, been importantly uh, um, insightful in helping try to build the research triangle region. So that's kind of a snapshot of the company and you know how we've tried to build our uh, you know ourselves. So uh, yeah, I'm very impressed with your growth and the valuation, stock price, and great dividends, by the way, for anybody looking for a great dividend stock. Uh, Alexandria Real Estate Equities has been uh, touted as one of the better dividend stocks. But more importantly, you jumped right into the company. I think uh, people would also like to know a little bit about your personal background, Joel, and then leading up to why was it that the life science industry and the wet lab industry caught your attention based on your prior experience in, in working before you made that decision? Sure. So I uh, grew up in uh, Colorado. Um, I was, uh, uh, I was um, in the Air Force. I was actually a medic in the Air Force, uh, two years uh, active duty and four years in the reserve. And weirdly enough, today's environment uh, with the um, unfortunate, uh, you know, killing of Mr. Floyd and the protests and even the riots that have ensued after that, it reminds me a little bit of 1968. I actually, personally, I was uh, on duty up at Travis Air Force Base during the Tet Offensive of uh, 1968. I remember kind of late January, February, and into March, kind of a little bit of the time frame we're in with COVID and uh, and the um, and the civil unrest going on today. And you know, Martin Luther King had been assassinated, Bobby Kennedy in June of '68 and then anti-war riots. And uh, my job at that time as a medic was I was assigned to a casualty staging unit. We weren't overseas, but we were flying in uh, wounded soldiers 24-7 from Kadena, Japan, and Subic Bay in the Philippines, uh, treating their wounds and then transporting and then sending them on to VA hospitals near either their base or their home uh, where they were, uh, you know, resident. And right. uh, Today's environment eerily reminds me of that time, kind of very strange. Uh, but I, I came uh, out to UCLA, graduated UCLA, both undergraduate and graduate. I got my CPA, worked in the uh, legal industry, and probably the, the seminal event of my uh, professional career um, post all of that, uh, that military stuff was um, in 1983, I got a call from Morgan Stanley who asked, would you come out to Thousand Oaks, California and um, work with a Japanese company? They're a beer company called Kirin, and they're working, they're thinking about doing a transaction with a company called Amgen. Well, I 
actually never heard of Amgen, so I had to look it up, applied molecular genetics in the early days, uh, found out a little bit about George, Raff, George Rathman and his uh, work at Abbott and beyond, and uh, found out that uh, they had cloned and expressed Fuqua Lin, a really great uh, scientist had cloned and expressed the gene for um, uh, erythropoietin, which has actually been featured on, if you are watching uh, 30, 30 by 30 on uh, ESPN, the Lance Armstrong story, obviously erythropoietin takes a uh, right. major uh, place in that whole cycling industry and certainly in his life. Uh, but I met uh, the Karen folks in uh, actually November of 1983. Uh, they had just met Amgen. Amgen had been through the United States and around the world trying to uh, promote EPO to a partner because they needed cash. They uh, actually were almost running out of cash um, and had very little to go on. And literally everybody had turned them down. Every major pharma company had turned them down. And they found this one kind of Japanese company that was thinking of diversifying into biotechnology. And so from the date we met out in Thousand Oaks, right around Thanksgiving of 1983, we signed a $24 million, really the first strategic partnership or strategic alliance of really merit in the biotechnology industry. We signed it on uh, May 13th, I believe, of uh, 1984. So literally within about five to six months, which is record time, a fairly complex joint venture. It wasn't just a passive license. It, uh, it was the setting up of a new company called Kieran Amgen, uh, which received the, um, all of the patent rights from uh, Amgen for EPO. Uh, also, Amgen put in, uh, I think, about $4 million of cash. Uh, Kieran put in uh, about $12 million of cash. And then the, the joint venture company licensed out rights to both Amgen and Kieran for uh, continued research, the development, and ultimately the commercialization of EPO, which up until I think maybe Humira time became or was the leading um, recombinant product. Uh, it's now been su substantially surpassed by uh, Humira. Um, but that was really the seminal event. Uh, I think very critical for the industry and very critical for my career because at that point I pivoted from being a, a corporate securities lawyer. My dad was a real estate developer, so I had a lot of real estate in my blood and pivoted to the biotech industry. And over the next uh, decade, spent most of my time working in venture capital, public offerings, private offerings, uh, and very importantly in strategic alliances and ended up representing most of the pharma companies in Japan on inbound investments into the US biotechnology companies. And that seeded the opportunity in 1993. I met Jerry Sadarsky and Joe Jacobs. Uh, Joe had founded Jacobs Engineering. They had built engineering company, architectural engineering and development for uh, Lilly, Genentech, and many of the biopharma companies. And they said, gee, we're interested in creating a company to actually invest in these properties. Would you help us put together a business plan and financial model and kind of the rest was history. And there you are. And thank you for that history. I think it's very interesting to see how people have progressed to where they are today and what really was the impetus for them to jump into this, this industry as you did. And I'm starting to get chat questions, which we'll get to. Sure. Uh, people are posting those questions, but you know, you talk about Michael Porter and you're now in seven markets and then you're looking at Pasadena potentially as an eight, which is sort of a sub-market at this particular Yeah, the L we'd call it the greater LA region. Okay, greater LA region, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so did you do a market, uh, Michael Porter cluster analysis study before you went into every market or what decisions did you use to make did. as to where you would go? We, we did. Um, in each of the major markets, uh, we did. We looked at a lot of other markets. We, we looked at Chicago, we looked at St. Louis, we looked at uh, Miami, uh, we looked at uh, Den Denver, my home, uh, Salt Lake City, we, we looked at Portland, Oregon, uh, many, many markets that uh, we, but this goes back to the early days of the company in the mid to late 90s and then early 2000s. But we really settled on the seven uh, major markets that we felt had the opportunity, had the four ingredients, and had the opportunity to really grow an ecosystem there in a meaningful fashion. I think it's possible to grow in other regions. We spent a little bit of time in India. Uh, 
we thought that would be a way India and China. We had small operations in each of those uh, markets because they contain half the or half half the world's population. But India, a few years after we got in there, overruled uh, the Supreme Court of India overruled the Gleevec patent, and so people weren't really interested in creating uh, novel medicines in uh, India. And China became a tougher market. We have probably the best asset in all of China. We sold one that we developed. We have another one we developed near Beijing. We still have, but the problem with China is the state, essentially state-owned companies, put up, you know facilities and then just give free rent. So the business model doesn't really work there. Um, but we've looked at a lot of markets historically, looked in Europe, but we've settled on the seven US markets and they clearly have served us uh, very well. Right, and that's another one sticking to your knitting too, right? Yeah. Well, we're also huge fans of Michael Porter. I mean, beyond Michael Porter of uh, Jim Collins, I would say. Right. And one of the things you learn with Jim Collins in his, um, you know, good to great series of books. Uh, one that, you know, is really important is, and that is, you, you know, you have to be resolutely disciplined in your business. And we've tried to be that, you know, from day one, a no ego environment, idea meritocracy, best idea wins, but fanatically focused on being disciplined about what we do and how we do it. And that's really, really critical. And he's also uh, reminds me of the environment we're in. He says, you know, to be built to last, which is one of his great books, you have to be built to change. And so we've never been set in our ways. We've always felt that there's a great opportunity to evolve, to iterate, and always become better and change. Yeah, I, I think that's very important. And, and a lot of people early in your life influence you later in the decisions you make. And uh, those are uh, two pretty good people to have had some very insightful vision. Now, let's Amazing. Talk clusters again and ecosystems. You mentioned the four things that are critical to you, infrastructure, risk capital, policy, thought leadership, and corporate responsibility. As you look at the- region, Those are kind of our, our verticals for our company going into the- For ARE, going into those markets, correct. Yeah. So the question would be, what would you determine is the most important criteria in any ecosystem or cluster that has to be there for you to want to get engaged? Yeah, that's, the, that's a simple answer. And this is true in venture capital as well. It's absolutely number one, you know, hands down is people. You gotta have location, you gotta have risk capital, you gotta have scientific and technology. But if you don't have the right people, again, a chapter out of Jim Collins's Good to Great book, if the right people aren't on the bus in the right seats, you go nowhere. And that's been a lesson we have learned you know, time and time again. It's really all about people. And maybe, honestly, you know, if you look at the biohealth region and the coalescing of that region, you know, think about that without Rich Benda. So it's, again, a people-driven kind of situation. Very purposeful. Good. Thank you for that. I, like, I appreciate that insight because, really, I also understand uh, another book that I read was Building a Quality Organization, and they basically said, the strength of the organizations is only as good as far as your shadow of reach. So it's good to have good leaders, but if you don't have people that can, you can get out and touch to expand your vision and your mission, then you're, you're pr probably going to fail. Yeah. And I also think it's important in uh, both uh, in, in leadership as well. We always say, you know, leaders can make the deals, but they also have to make the coffee. And if somebody's not willing to make the coffee and do the little dirty things that we need to do every day. If you can't do both, you know, you aren't a good leader. You can't just be, you know, up there on a pedestal type right. thing, doing deals or doing, you know, great things. You got to, you know, roll up your sleeves. You got to clean the floors. You got to pick up. I mean, I routinely, I spent a lot of time in New York up till recently, um, given, you know, what's going on there. Right. But uh, I routinely, go around and inspect the premises and I pick up cigarette butts and stuff. And people ask me like, Whoa, why are you doing that? And I go like, that's my job. Yeah. You know, that's well, not that's my, my property job, but <laughs> I want to be proud of our facility. We have a right. world class campus there. We put a billion dollars into it and I want to be proud of it. And right. I can pick up cigarettes just as much as uh, cleaning folks can. Yes. Yeah, so someone just asked a question. I think it's a very good one and insightful. Uh, you've studied, you, you focused on the seven markets now, potentially an eighth one coming. Is there anybody you passed on that you analyzed that now in hindsight wish that you had gone forward with 
Uh, but back at that time, it wasn't the right decision. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's a very simple one, right? It, yeah, it is. Um, you're I mean, we, we like the Texas market as an example, uh, but, and we were close to doing something in the, you know, greater Texas uh, state for a lot of reasons. It's a well-run state, um, a lot of businesses, a lot of activity, a lot of great science and technology, a lot of great institutions, but it missed, at least at the moment, it, it, it doesn't have the entrepreneurial and management depth to it. And we hope it will happen over the next decade. At the moment, we just assess that the, the depth of the talent there wasn't quite right. Right. And then also, you know the name of this uh, association is the Association for University Research Parks. Yes. It, it's, it's evolved some to where it's not just university parks. They've gotten broader now. But at the end of the day, uh, talk about the importance from your perspective of the research-based universities in your ecosystems where you are in those seven markets. Yeah, maybe I'll also talk about where we aren't. So right. we think that, uh, you know, we chose Seattle because it was anchored by many nonprofit institutions, uh, including world-class institutions like Gates, the Fred Hutch Cancer Research uh, Center, uh, University of Washington, and there are many more. And we felt those were great anchors to that region in San Francisco. Obviously, Stanford, UCSF, Berkeley uh, are major contributors there, which are world class. San Diego, it's Scripps, it's Burnham, it's UCSD, um, and Greater Boston, obviously, MIT being really the top of the top. There's a book that they put out a couple of years ago that MIT's uh, output of science and technology uh, would equal the eighth greatest, the eighth largest GDP of any country on earth. I mean, a, a number that's astounding. Amazing. Obviously, yeah. Harvard and many of the other great, and many of the great, you know, hospitals and teaching institutions there. Uh, New York City is has got you know the eight or nine among the greatest uh, in in the world. Maryland, as you know well, I don't have to repeat the institutions that are there are great. And then in the triangle, you've got the three cities and the three great universities there. So th those are the things that kind of anchored our analysis and decisions as we went into each of the markets. We, we like a lot of the institutions in Texas. I think they're, they're world class. There isn't enough of a commercialization class yet there that we're, we're watching and hoping over the next decade that may happen. Um, there are other great institutions in a number of locations. The, the challenge with some locations though is you may have a single sighted institution, but if there isn't enough around it that can act as you know, the fertilizer of the ecosystem, then you're stuck with a single institution and dependent upon that. Uh, and that's a challenge. We looked at New Haven, we, we love Yale, we think Yale's got world-class science, but there wasn't enough around it to make us feel like we could commit to going into New Haven. I spent a lot of time up there, but at the end of the day, that was a decision we made. It was a, a one institution market and not deep enough that we felt we just didn't want to make the investment. That's a good example, but a world-class institution. Thank you for the insight. Uh, another question's come up, Joel, about uh, pre-COVID, post-COVID, and how do you view, uh, you know, sort of your industry, the market, nationally, do you see anything that's going to be a dramatic change post-COVID versus what you were experiencing pre-COVID? Yeah, so maybe let me take you back to a phrase that Bernie Sanders uh, used pre-COVID when he was on the trail. And this is not a political comment, but it's one for our industry. He was, you know, he, he, he's a very charismatic guy. Um, I don't agree with his uh, view of the world, but he would use his finger and point, and I remember him saying, and, and I did follow him in one of his speeches, is we need to lock up and put in prison, you know, the biopharma CEOs who are ripping off the country. And I thought about that, and I thought about the days of uh, Merck and Roy Bagelos, the number one most admired CEO in pharma, the number one most admired company in the country, uh, on the cover of, you know, Fortune and uh, you know Business Week and all those right. things and I thought, look how far we've come in this in this industry, bio and pharma. 
look how much good we've done, but a few um, apples have spoiled, you know, the barrel. And in a sense, this is true of police. You know, a few can make the rest look terrible. And I thought, how horrible. And now we're moving into an election season. I thought, boy, this industry, you know, everyone was Elizabeth Warren. Everyone was beating up, you know, the pharma, the drug industry as being the bad boys or bad girls, whatever you want to say. And I think COVID really shifted the sentiment. It gave us a chance. This industry is a noble industry. It's a good industry. Uh, it is a great industry for what, what we do and how we do it. And I think COVID-19 catapulted the industry. And I've said on a lot of earnings calls for many, many years that this industry is really the solution to the problem of healthcare. You can build hospitals, you can man hospitals, you can put, whether it's government run, private run, you can do all kinds of things in healthcare. But if you cannot you know, diagnose disease, treat it and ultimately cure it, and there are 10,000 known diseases, only 500 of which we've really addressed therapeutically and not all effectively, um, we're still in the early innings, but COVID-19 has now put the industry front and center. It's essential, it's critical, and it is the solution to the problem. And if we can make sure to get rid of you know, the bad apples and bring great leadership, the new era of the Roy Vagelosis, I think that's going to be a great thing. So uh, thank you for, for that perspective. I think also the key would be is, I think I heard you uh, talking on Squawk Box about you know the tenants that you have in your facilities now and how you really have not significantly be hurt from a cash flow or a rent perspective because everybody's keeping up with their ability to, to pay their rents to Alexandria right now. Well, that's true. I mean, I think our portfolio uh, and asset base, which approximates almost 30 million square feet, by far the largest of anyone you know, by, by multiples, um, and we have another 10 million square feet of future development, uh, which is pretty, pretty massive. You know, in, in the month of May, we collected 99.2% of our rent. The only rent we didn't collect was retail rent, and we've given those, um, you know, a hiatus, and hopefully uh, we can help some of those people out, hopefully through PPP or, you know, a variety of other tax. So I think we're very, very fortunate and very benefited. Um, and I think the industry uh, is important. It's essential. It's critical. Our labs have operated 24-7. And, you know, we have to, and our people have been on the front lines of helping run those labs and keeping those facilities open and safe. And I think that's been really the story of this, of this industry. And it's been a healthy industry. We have over half of our tenant base is, um, you know, investment grade or very, very large um, publicly traded companies. So we've worked hard. We do a lot of early stage, but we've worked hard to have a solid base uh, so we don't have to worry and we can go to sleep at night and not worry about tomorrow. Good client selection. Now, you talked about early in your career, the venture capital, investment banking world, and that's an important component to Alexandria real estate. So a lot of people don't know, and I, I've learned just by being associated with you, uh, that over the last, I think, two and a half years, you've been the leading venture capital investor in the United States in the number of deals. Correct. But he thinks that if you're not in an Alexandria property that you won't get funded. But I also have learned, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that 66% of the deals that you invest in are not in Alexandria properties. Uh, that's correct. So we manage a portfolio of about uh, 1.1, 1.2 billion dollars. We started in 1996 as a uh, private company. Um, we've done very, very well. We even invested in Series A of Google in 1998, and we still hold some of that stock today. So we tend to be long-term holders and not flippers. Um, but our view is um, this was not really done to facilitate the real estate side of the business. It really was done because of the principle of Michael Porter. If we couldn't, you and I are involved in trying to help create some of that in the Maryland or in the greater biohealth region, but in Maryland as well. Um, if you can't bring risk capital to bear, 
it's hard to build an ecosystem. And I think that's been one of the successes of New York. New York will never, New York City will never be a Boston or a San Francisco. It just can't be. And after the recent riots, it, it may take a generation for New York to come back, unfortunately. There's been truly generational damage that's been allowed to happen there. And my heart is really sad because my daughter is there. Um, but um, I would say that if you can't bring risk capital to the ecosystem and to growing these clusters, you really don't have a shot at, at doing that. You've got the people, but if you don't have the risk capital, it just doesn't work well. And that's the big problem with a lot of secondary locations. And frankly, that's been the challenge with Texas and uh, you know, a lot of the Midwest states and some of the Southern states and even some of the Western states, the level of risk capital or the amount of risk capital in those locations just has not been very great. We see over the last five years, New York has gone you know, substantially uh, uh, positive in risk capital and a lot of venture firms coming into that, uh, that particular location. And that's been a huge, huge help. And we hope we can duplicate that in the biohealth region. Well, well, keep investing, Joel, because we need your investments in this, uh, in nationally, actually, in the biohealth industry. And I think when you came on earlier, someone had asked a question about incubators. And I think maybe this is a good time to just talk a little bit about your concept around Launch Labs and that program which you're, you've created and it started to expand to other regions. Right. So kudos to uh, Larry Diamond, who uh, is uh, one of our, our co-chief operating officer and runs our Maryland region and really a great leader. I met Larry in 1998. As soon as I met him, I go like, we should uh, work together. And we've worked together ever since, so a long-term relationship. And Larry's been very, very instrumental in helping build the uh, ecosystem and the region in the uh, greater Maryland area and biohealth region. Um, and What's been really important, I think, is um, uh, if you think about, and we, we actually invented and started our, our Launch Lab product in the Maryland region and in collaboration with you guys and uh, you know Montgomery County and so forth, we've expanded it into New York City, into Cambridge, uh, into Seattle, uh, into Research Triangle region, um, and here in Pasadena. Um, it really is an opportunity at a very low price uh, to get a, a lab and a, you know, a lab bench and maybe an office and then are, there are some private. It's not so much that it's a co-working space, but it's a collaborative space, uh, you know, deep programming, great leadership. We have a, um, you know, seed capital platform we bring to bear on top of that. Uh, and it really is important that... Um, we, uh, we nurture early stage companies, but we're pretty mindful of trying to choose good ones. We're not a economic development incubator in the sense of we just want to get people in and they can stay there the rest of their lives. We really want to get great people who have great scientific, you know, uh, things that will move the field forward in important ways and try to get those teams get those teams financed and get them growing and growing hopefully out of the out of the incubation space we really don't want people just to uh, you know plant themselves there and stay there and not really do good things right well I, it sort of brings another element to the whole um, infrastructure that you're yeah. trying to build and I, I would say somebody I listened to the last panel for a few minutes and somebody was saying about New York City well actually you could get a lab bench from us uh, and an and a office space um, for under $2,000. And I think uh, many of the other incubators there have pretty, pretty affordable. So at a very early stage, actually things are much more affordable than you think. You, you know, don't listen to what a lot of people say unless they have experience on the ground because it's not true. Uh, another question that's come up is what do, you, what do you see as the international plans or the international market for Alexandria? Yeah, as I said, we don't have any future plans. We think uh, our best uh, days are ahead here in the United States. Uh, so we're, you know, uh, America first in that sense. Um, and we did have an operation in India. We exited that, I, as I said, because of the Indian Supreme Court decision on Gleevec, which was hard to understand. Uh, we exited one asset in China. We have one more. 
Um, but we're not building more there because the state government and the local governments essentially compete with you. They build you know, poor quality facilities, but then just give them away free to Chinese uh, companies. So we didn't think you could build a Western style business model there. Um, but I think this is the best country, prefer to invest in this country. Um, you know, we've, we've had some assets, we do have some assets in Canada, we'll probably continue that. But Canada is a small market. Um, and probably will not go anywhere else. There's a lot of states that we haven't been in, and maybe over the next decade or so, we would see expansion in other places. Thank you. Uh, I think we're almost closing, but what I wanna do is to have, let you have the last words on sort of your vision for the future and words of wisdom for the people who are listening and attending this conference, and then we might have five minutes left for a few questions, if anybody has questions to ask of you, if that's sure. okay. So let me catapult to what I said before. I think that this industry and what's happened with COVID-19, you would never wish this on anyone, anywhere, at any time, but it is here and we are faced with it, that leaders of the industry should propel themselves ahead and really thinking about you know, the greater good and how we can bring science and technology to bear to not overcome this pandemic, but really solve the 9,500 other illnesses that are out there that we haven't yet uh, been able to address. Great testing, great diagnostics, great therapies, hopefully cures. And um, if we do it in a way that's um, collaborative, humble, without ego, and with the greater good in mind, and really always concentrating on developing, you know, breakthrough products, you know, really differentiated products for unmet medical needs, that's where it really resides. And I think we'll, we'll fare well with the politicians, whether it's you know, the left or the right or the center. If they believe this industry is um, essential and really the solution, then we'll thrive. But if we don't meet that challenge, then you know, we won't do as well. And so to me, that's the biggest challenge of today beyond the, the um, you know, the cultural and, uh, and socioeconomic challenges that we have as a country, the greatest country on earth. We have a lot of faults, but let's hope we can overcome those faults day by day and what's in our heart really counts. So that, that'd be my message. Well, your passion comes through and that challenge you just put out there is a challenge to all of us. Uh, because, you know, we're really fortunate, and I've been talking to my people uh, are in our industry, and we're fortunate to be in this industry right now. We're, we're very blessed. We're very blessed because we are essential uh, to what's important to the world in the future. And so while a lot of these other industries are struggling, this biohealth, life science, pharma, medical device, biomarker tool industry is really vibrant right now, and we need to keep that momentum going post-COVID. Post I would also say, I think this uh, pandemic has also brought to bear uh, something else that we're seeing. We have 70 plus tenants that are directly, uh, you know, in, are directly working on COVID-19 solutions across the board. Um, and I think what's happening is more and more of these companies are, and the government is certainly looking at this, and there may be legislation to help it, bringing back more research, more development, and uh, more manufacturing. And we see a big upswing in those things coming back to the states. And I think that's a great thing. I think over the years, we, we have outsourced, and I think politicians have rightly focused on this, we have outsourced too much you know, essential manufacturing of United States uh, necessities. We saw in the PPE thing, you know, our company was able to source almost 55,000 uh, PPE items and we donated them about seven hospitals in key markets of ours. Um, you know, it's not gigantic, but it's, uh, it's important. That was during the latter March period where right. it was really kind of Pretty critical. Cool. But if we get that manufacturing back and create that base, we're going to have not only our markets, but many other markets really benefit greatly. Well, you sound bullish on America, and we all should be right now, Joel. So I want to thank you for your comments. And Brian has just popped up with his picture up there. Brian, do you know if there's any questions for Joel before we would close? Well, um, a short question. Um, 
What about, uh, and Joel, you th and thank you very much for, um, for, for joining us. Of course, my, my great pleasure. Um, you know, I think just like people think New York City has only really expensive um, uh, real estate uh, for life science companies, another issue is you need a PhD to work in a biotech company. And, and with recent events, you know, engagement with the local communities, technicians, technician training for uh, members out of the local community to help biotech companies. Can you talk a little bit about the role and responsibility of anchor institutions to engage with the local community in programs such as technical training, those kinds of things? Well, yeah, I'll just speak maybe about ourselves. I, I can't, I shouldn't be a proselytizer for uh, other institutions or companies, but um, uh, a couple of years ago, Fred Wilson at Mayor de Blasio's request uh, raised from the private sector uh, many tens of millions of dollars, and we were a seven-figure contributor to that to build uh, computers in every public school in New York City and to build a really strong STEM education. I mean, my, my own personal belief about what we've seen in the streets is, you know, there's the today and the horror of what happened to uh, George Floyd. But beyond that, there is a lack of educational opportunities and a lack of training opportunities that we need to bring to bear. So our company is super focused on that, um, on our corporate responsibility side. We're a major, um, uh, you know, we're very involved with Robin Hood, which is the largest poverty fighting organization in New York City. They just raised $115 million. They have zero, you know, GNA overhead. All the directors essentially pay for that. So we, we spent a lot of time on that, a lot of time with Fred Wilson and Mayor de Blasio's initiative STEM in New York City. We're, we're partnered with Mike Krzyzewski, great Coach K in Durham. He has the Emily K Foundation. Um, I'm on the board there and I, we're also very involved in helping support bringing all of the underprivileged kids at the high school level in Durham into after school programs and into uh, preparatory work for uh, getting into college. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, and hopefully Coach K uh, will uh, will confirm this, they have a 100% acceptance rate into uh, colleges from the Emily K Foundation, which has now been going on 12 years. It seems to me beyond the issues of police brutality or unfairness in the society, there are tangible things we can do at the ground level, like I just explained, we're just doing a few of them, but everybody can do a whole bunch of them that I think over time will in fact affect change. And think about, you know, no one ever imagined, if you go back to the civil rights struggles of the 60s, I, what I was saying about 68, no one ever imagined a African-American president. And yet we had an eight-year president in Barack Obama. So there has been great strides made, but there's a lot more to do. Well, good. Well, with that, uh, no, that's very inspirational. Uh, thank you, Joel. Thank you, Rich. Great honor. Uh, great pleasure. Uh, yes, we're a little bit over time, so we're going to be winding this up. Again, I want to thank our keynoter, Rich. I want to thank the participants, the panelists. Uh,